So welcome everybody to our podcast series, Archetypal Wisdom, The Shakespeare Perspective. And it's a great pleasure today to be in conversation with Philida Hancock. Philida is a workshop designer and facilitator focusing on leadership, communication, and organizational development. She worked as an actor and singer for 15 years in theater and on television, including two years with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And in 1998, began working mainly in the public sector, designing and delivering workshops, initially using role play and forum theater. She then moved to the UK government future focus at DTI facility from 1999 to 2010, facilitating conversations with policymakers on scenario planning, performance management, business planning and project working with departments and their stakeholders across business and government. Philida is also a senior program director of Olivier Mythodrama and works with several other consultancies, including contributing to the Aurora program for women in higher education. So welcome, Philida. Great to be talking with you today. Hi. And we're going to focus in initially on The Tempest, Shakespeare's last play, some would say one of his greatest plays in which all the wisdom accumulated over many years of writing are encoded. And The Tempest is really as we work with it in the Mythodrama Company around transformation, change, urgency, engaging the team, managing reactions, seeing change as an inside as an outside job. And really our conversation now is about what you have noticed over the years and also particularly now that you feel is encoded in the Tempest that's really useful leadership lessons for leaders of today. Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that it's called The Tempest, and The Tempest lasts for about five minutes. And the rest of the play is about the aftermath of The Tempest and what comes out of it, um, including some bad behaviour, some good behaviour, some tough requirements for change in some of the characters. Uh, and that strikes me as an extremely good metaphor for now, because... Uh, we are in the middle of a tempest right now and it's tough, really, 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 really tough for some people. Um, and what we're also beginning to understand is that the tale is going to go on for a very long time. And that the, the instinct or the desire to just scrabble and get back to how it was before is a really dangerous one and a very unhelpful one. Uh, one of the metaphors that we work with in the play is that we can to some extent recreate what we know, but it will only work if it works better. So the very beginning of the play, we see a ship being smashed to pieces in the storm. Um, and we know that it's the king's ship. So it's, and one of the sailors says that it's Yar. It's, it's, a, it's a really great ship. It's probably, you know, all got all the modern technology on it. It's the best ship that can be. And yet in the climate that it encounters, it's not the right vessel. It can't survive. Um, and at the end of the play, they go off again in the same ship. And the question is, you know, how, how do we make the, make the best use of what we already know and what we're expert in, but rebuild it in a way that will survive the world we're going into? Uh, that strikes me as a very useful metaphor. There's also, you spoke about urgency, and there certainly is a sense of urgency in this play. It, it, I mean, I can't really say that many of Shakespeare's plays move fast. <laughs> um, Macbeth, perhaps, and Julius Caesar. But there is... Uh, a sense of motion goes throughout the play. We meet, lot, there are lots of characters in it. They, a lot of them change. A lot of them are, are physically moving around this island. But there's also in the heart of it um, a, a calmness. The, the whole play, as far as we know, it was the last play that he wrote on his own. Um, we're fairly sure that he wrote it in Stratford, not in London. And it has a, a valedictory feel to it. Um, it's very much looking back. If you feel as if it's an, an older man looking back over what he's learned, but he's also really looking to the future. So there's a, there's a, there is within it a sense of reflection within the eye of the storm. So that I think is also very interesting. And what I'm certainly, I'm sure you're the same, what I'm learning talking to many, many people who are curious about what's going to happen next is that this time for reflection is very useful. And the more we give in to that desperate need to use the time. I, I was talking to someone yesterday and I heard myself saying, I feel as if I'm failing at lockdown <laughs> because I'm not doing all the stuff <clears throat> that I'm being told I should be doing. I'm not learning to speak Esperanto and I'm not, you know. 
learning a new instrument and I'm not playing quizzes every night. And, and that, the, the, the opportunity to properly slow down now is a really important one. And I wonder if we can hold on to that as we go on into the next phase. Yeah, that's great. I also think it's really interesting when we slow down, what do we start to notice also? Yeah. The, play, the play has a lot in it also about kind of death and rebirth and kind of cycles of allowing something to die so that something else can be born. So the ship goes down and as you say, a new ship is kind of born at the end. And then it seems the various characters have died from the, from the shipwreck, but actually they, they materialize and they've been transformed into something else. It has a lot of kind of the transformer archetype, as we might say in it. And I wonder what you're noticing about that in this time also what is it that needs to die or how do we support leaders in allowing things to die in order that something new and maybe more fit for purpose can be born yes uh, it's always a theme that comes out of this um one of the beautiful pieces of poetry in the play is a song that is sung to one of the characters the son of the king who believes he's watched his father drown and he hears this song uh, that says, full, full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. And there's something around that which really speaks to this bit. We, we talk quite a lot about honouring the past, which, which some people understand very clearly and others kind of say, what does that actually mean? And there's something here about, can we find the value, the, the, the tangible value in something that is no longer with us or no longer is needed, but that we need to hold on to? I think it's quite dangerous. Um, as you know, you know, you and I both work quite a lot for the Oxford Business School and often find ourselves working in some of the very old buildings. In Oxford and I I love going there uh, and I know you were a student there I was a student at a slightly less old institution um, but there there is this real sense that it's steeped in history and that the foundations are are massively uh, grounded in ancient wisdom and in the old ways of doing things um, and as at the same time they're yearning to stretch forward into the future you know these great research institutions are all about pushing the future and boundaries and what else can we find and that can be an uncomfortable straddling and we've seen over the last few years you know the uprisings against statues of Rhodes in Oxford you know the, the things that and it, it is inescapable you go into those buildings and all you see are portraits of old dead old blokes everywhere and so there is there it's we don't want to be too much clinging on to the past but at the same time to have a good understanding of what we as an institution as an organization as a group of people have really benefited from that we say thank you for um, and recognize that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as Newton put it. And, it. and I think that's a useful way of looking at it. Does that make sense? Yeah, beautiful. No, totally makes sense. Mm. And I'm always curious also about the generations in the play. Like we see Ferdinand and Miranda as the kind of people who fall in love, seeding the possible new future. They seem to be our change champions, if you like, people who kind of get the possibility in the future. And, and I'm curious about that on a generational level. Like, is this a time when we need to look at the new parts of us or the kind of new parts, the new, the, the, the next generations that are coming through literally, like people who are younger. And I'm also curious about the balance of realism and optimism. Like we see Gonzalo talking when he's one of the lords, he's kind of washed up on the island. He says, what a great opportunity there is here. And I can also hear people talking now about the virus and saying, well, what an opportunity we have here. But actually they're talking to people whose maybe relatives are dying or you know, who don't have any income. And where's the place for a tempered optimism? So maybe you could speak to those two themes, the, the, the youth and the, or the next generation. And also where's the place for optimism and what's the timing around that? Yes, the generational thing is fascinating. The last four plays that Shakespeare wrote, all have at their core a relationship between a father and a daughter. The Cymbeline and Pericles, The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. And that intrigues me. Uh, and the mothers are nowhere to be seen, <laughs> as usual in Shakespeare. Um, partly because he didn't have actors to play women, you know, it was tough. But so there's something about that. There's a balancing that happens, particularly in this play. In the first half of the play, Prospero is absolutely the magician. He's in charge of everything. He creates a storm. He can bring the, the sea and the sky 
to kiss each other. You know, he shakes the whole island, he produces fire, he makes Miranda go to sleep, he forces Ferdinand to be in chains, and he breaks his sword. I mean, he's completely in control of everything. And then there's a scene, there's a, the, the play is created like an, a narrative arch in that the scenes that lead up to the central scene are mirrored in terms of the characters they're about, are mirrored in the scenes that lead away from the central scene. And this keystone scene in the middle is the scene where Miranda and Ferdinand come together. They break some rules, they come together, they declare their love for one another. And Prosper is watching this invisibly. And he seems to be very touched by what he sees almost as if he's not expecting it. He can arrange for them to come together, but he cannot, he's not in control of their love and their magic. And certainly from that point in the play, he becomes more visible as a leader, as a character. He's, he's invisible for most of the first half to everyone except the audience <coughs> and the characters who know him. In the second half, he is much more visible. He talks about himself as a father in the second half. Um, and there's a kind of grief, there's a very sweet scene where he, agrees to the marriage of the two of them. And he keeps going on to Ferdinand about not sleeping with Miranda before the wedding night. And he does it three or four times. And it's kind of, it's funny. And Ferdinand says, all right, keep your hair on. <laughs> but it, it's, it's almost as if he's, he's finding it hard to let go of his daughter. And the fathers of daughters will know this. <laughs> um, so there's something about handing on to the next generation that, that is a real issue in organizations. I, I certainly have sat in on discussions where I've heard people talk about succession planning and it really is a struggle not to recruit people who are like us. It's really hard for some, especially organisations that have been for around, around for a long time and their reputation rests on their having been around for a long time, to consciously recruit people who are not like them and to allow them to have their own magic and their own way of doing things. And I think that is a really it always has been an interesting issue but perhaps even now and it is tricky because the next generation don't know as much as we do and they they haven't been through life and they're not sitting in their garden at the end of their lives looking back over it and they are uh, eager to smash things up and do things differently and the renegade archetype that we talk about is is visible in the world around us uh, always has been and how do you harness that in such a way that as leaders you can hold that in, you can create the greenhouse for that to grow and then let it take over when when you're ready and that's hard too and as you know we do an exercise in the in the program around this play where we invite leaders to think about giving up some of their magic at the end of the play Prospero gives up his magic well he gives up his rough magic I think he holds on to some of his other stuff but he gives up the, the magic that smashes things up and that causes disruption and disturbance he gives that up so what does it require? I mean, these are great points that you're raising, and I'm curious what it requires in leaders to allow the renegade to come in, to allow the younger generation to come in, to say something has to change in me. It seems to me it requires a lot of humility. It requires a kind of focus on a bigger purpose. It's not just about how do I look in all this, but kind of what am I serving? And Prosper also grows through this big shift from revenge to forgiveness, like he has a big heart opening in the second half of the play. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what do you think is required, particularly at a time like this, where the, the, the wish to kind of return to some kind of normal, which I don't think is ever going to happen. I don't think there's a kind of new normal. The new normal is that there is no normal. You know, the, 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 but there's a kind of wish to hang on to something. What is it that, that, that in leadership we need inside us to allow these bigger movements, death and rebirth, we've talked about the renegade, giving up to the next generation, changing something in myself. How do we cultivate that within ourselves as leaders? Yes, uh, well, I've heard you speak before about spaciousness, and I think it's that. I think it's creating internally and externally a space, a, a proper space. What was that quote about space in time? I don't remember which You had one. a quotation that somebody said that uh, meditation is, is like a, creating a space within time or something like that. I'll look it up. But there's something, uh, one of the things we say about this play is that after the storm, the whole play takes place on this island, which actually is not home to any of the characters. There isn't, there isn't, there aren't any characters in the play that are native to that island. The one that comes closest is the tricky character of Caliban, who has lived there all his life and 
truly properly loves it. I mean, loves it and speaks the most beautiful poetry in the play comes out of Caliban's mouth. Um, and he is a tricky character. He's been, he's behaved badly and been badly treated. Um, and the relationship with Prospero is very, very bad. But at the end, he gets what he wants. He gets given his island back. So there, there is this idea of having a space where no one is at home and there is no, there's less of a hierarchy to explore on a more, on a flatter level, how we are and, and what it means to be us. What we you know, as we, as we come back together after the lockdown, what does it mean to be us? And that includes who we have been. So I think this, we don't want to chuck out the baby with the bathwater. We don't want to, uh, you know, take the opportunity to start from scratch because no one can do that. But it goes back to this idea of what do we hold on to from the past that tells us who we are and use that as an opportunity to think about who, who do we want to be in the future world. When I used to do scenario planning work, that was always a really important question. Who do we always want to be? Whatever happens in the world, whatever, however the world pans out, what does it mean to be us? What is it that, we, that is ours to do in the world? And what will that require us to learn? Does that, does that sort of answer your question? There's something yeah, about I mean, it's lovely. I think you're talking about the inner space and the outer space. And, and the island is a kind of liminal space between two knowns. It's a kind of known of the old system and the known of the new system. It makes me think about places where we can experiment also. You know, in Otto Sharma's theory, you, kind of the right side of the you, you have a lot of rapid prototyping and feedback systems to say like what's working and what's not working so that we can really birth something. But it comes out of sitting at the bottom of the U where there's a lot of space and a lot of I don't know and a lot of presencing and just being with and allowing something to arise. So somehow, and this is also a question for me in the leadership work that I do, is working on the balance between urgency like there seems to be an urgency to fix things, to get things moving, to get the lockdown over, like whatever it might be, and the kind of a, a slowing down that's needed in order to create the space that you talk about. So I'm wondering also what there is in the play, but also what else you might have to say about the balance of kind of urgency and speed and slowing down and receiving what we need to receive. Yes, well, and to go back to your original question about what is the leader's role in that. So I think there's something about in using our archetypal model. I would say that certainly for this space, that it's a combination of the sovereign and the transformer. So there needs to be enough authority in the leader to say, I'm in charge and this is what's going to happen now and use that authority to create the space to have the conversation. So to it's almost like creating an illusion of time slowing down. And, and I saw a wonderful example of this. Uh, my father died uh, five years ago now, and he had a very horrible end. He had a horrible form of dementia and he was in hospital with various things. And the hospital couldn't, I imagine this is happening to some extent now, the hospital couldn't save him. Um, they couldn't cure him and they needed the bed for somebody that they could save and they tried to get rid of him and it was a very unfortunate way and they behaved very badly and in the end we managed to find a place for him in the hospital after three days of really it was really difficult um, but they found a place uh, on a ward and there was a nurse on that ward who the best example I've ever seen of someone who created the illusion of time he he, he made me feel as if I was the most important thing and my father was the most important thing and he just slowed everything down so that we could, I could speak, he could speak, we could arrange, you know what I mean? And, and that always struck me as an extraordinary gift that when things are frantic, um, how can you get rid of the stuff that you really don't need to be doing today and hold, hold that space as a, as a kind of sovereign archetype? within which you can do the transforming work of understanding that things are difficult, things are painful, things are strange. There's a loss of identity. You know, the very big, one of the first things that happens in the storm in the play is the, soul, the sailors jump into the sea and shout, we split, we split. And organizations can have that feeling at a time of change that's, that, that, that they are being torn apart. We split, you know, our, our identity is being taken away from us. I don't know what it means to be me in this place anymore. I don't know what, what it means to be me here. And that now my skills are being taken. You know, all that kind of stuff is going on. So that's the role of the leader at this point. And what happens in the play is quite interesting is that the king of Naples, Alonso, who is shipwrecked, 
with everyone else, but feels that he and his group of nobles are the only people who have survived and he thinks his son is dead at exactly the time when he should be taking on that role, exactly the point when he should be bringing people together, reassuring them, delegating tasks like building, finding wood and finding food and building shelter. He is, he is absent because he's lost in grief. So the other painful thing for leaders is that maybe we leaders can't afford too much to be lost in their own grief. I think that there's a time for honesty and to say, I'm finding this as tough as you are, but not too much because then you, you abdicate that, that desperate need for somebody to hold the thing. And Prosper does the same thing. You know, he's holding the two young people until they're ready. And you'll never know the moment and it will always be difficult, but, but you don't want to push them too quickly. Right. And at the end, <clears throat> Prospero conjures this circle, like he's broken his stuff. He's given up the magic, as you say, or some parts of his magic, maybe the old disruptive magic, the ways that he perpetuated himself in power and influence that no longer serves. So as Gandhi said, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. We can't just talk about change out there. It's an inside job also. And then he conjures this circle where he invites in all the different characters. And I wonder if there's something of the sovereign in that moment also that says there's a place for everybody in this kind of kingdom, if you like. There's a place for this right relationship that we need to restore also. And maybe it comes through Prospero towards the end, would you say that? Well, I think it does. And it's interesting you say right relationship, because the other thing he does, when he, he, he breaks his magic staff and he buries, he drowns his book in the sea, although we don't actually see that happen. I'm very skeptical that he gives up his magic. Um, but the other thing he does is he, he, he puts on the clothes that he wore when he was the Duke of Milan. So for people who don't know the play very well, what happens before the play begins is that Prosper is the Duke of Milan and a prince of power, he says. And as he is in that role, he is determined to better himself and increase his learning. Um, and so he spends a lot of time studying and he delegates the job of being the Duke to his brother who seizes power. Um, and at the end of the play, he goes back to being the Duke of Milan. And it's a really interesting moment because it's, it, he puts on, it's very important that he puts on the clothes. Um, and he talks about, I will retire me to Milan. And there's a, there's a bit of wordplay in that. So I will re-attire me to Milan. So I will put back on the, the dukedom, the, the fact of being the Duke, the presence, the purpose of being a Duke. And it's almost as if he shrinks back into his right shape that as a magician, he's been too big. He's, he's had this extraordinary control. He has the long speech about all the amazing things he's done and it's all very violent, his magic. And he, he kind of, he shrinks back, shrink is the wrong word. He, 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 he finds his proper place. And that is how he greets the people with whom he's going to travel into the future. And, and the king sees him and recognizes him. But the other thing that happens is Caliban, his enemy, this, this creature that he's been fighting with for all these years, Caliban comes on and sees Prospero dressed as the Duke of Milan. And Caliban says, how fine my master looks. Hmm. So he sees Prospero in his true shape and recognizes the nobility of it. It's absolutely fascinating. And all, what always strikes me is even if you go to see this play, all of this stuff would go <laughs> completely over your head. And yet it's all in there. You know, it's all. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Prospero also says to Caliban, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. And we don't know quite what, again, that can be taken in lots of different ways, but maybe he's saying, the way I like to look at it is maybe he's saying, I have a shadow too, or I have a part, because Caliban's been portrayed as someone who's very much in it for himself. Like, what can I get out of this? And maybe there's a place in leadership where we need to acknowledge our shadows and acknowledge the part that's in it for me. We're not always going to be kind of holier than thou and doing it for the greater good. And I want to serve humanity. I mean, that's lovely. And that's a part of our leadership for sure. But there's going to be a part of us, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. There's going to be a part of us that also has a bit that's saying, how am I appearing in all this? And what's the next position that I can occupy? And how can I take advantage of these circumstances to maybe feather my own nest a little bit? And just to acknowledge that doesn't mean we have to give it a lot of space and have it play out. But to acknowledge that self-awareness in leadership, I think, is also pretty critical. Yeah. And to understand it. I mean, I, what's interesting and fascinating about Caliban is that he, the reason he and Prospero have such a bad relationship is that Caliban has tried to rape Miranda having grown up with her as a, kind of like, as a member of the household, she arrives as a baby. When she hits puberty, he decides she's going to be his wife. Um, and understandably, uh, Prospero punishes him for that. Um, 
but we don't see Caliban behaving badly. All we see is his treatment at the hands of Prospero. So it's almost impossible not to feel sorry for Caliban. And the other thing we know about Caliban, because we see it happen twice, is that he loves the island. He knows every inch of it. He knows where the fresh water is, where the tasty berries are, where the beautiful bird song is. He knows where the jay's nest is. He knows where to go to hear the extraordinary beautiful music. And all he wants to do is share it with other people. He wants other people to see it the way he sees it. And he says to Prospero, you know, you, you've taken my island from me. He says, you stop, he says, you keep me in this, you sty me in this cave. He says, like a pig sty, you sty me here and keep me from the rest of the island. And all he wants is his island back. So I, I think what Prospero sees that at the end and, and the darkness that he recognizes is his part in that broken and dangerous relationship. We don't get too Jungian about it because it's kind of 300 years before Jung, but, but there's something in there. I mean, it is an extraordinary thing that he says, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. Um, in the same breath as they, he's handed over the Trinculo and Stefano who are equally part of a murder plot to their king. So there's, yeah, it's tricky. So it's, it's something about having compassion and really trying to get underneath those people who behave badly, the saboteurs, the people who res resist change, who, who, who get in the way and who gossip and are cynical. There's almost always a reason for it, you know? Yeah, and also, as you say, knowing what is my responsibility and what isn't. So he says, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. This part I take on. And you say Trinculo and Stefano, part of a drunken conspiracy. They belong over there. And Alonso, you know, it's over here. Like different people have their, it's about right relationship, as I say. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also about what am I responsible for and what am I not responsible for? And where Absolutely. do I delegate? You are actually responsible for taking care of these parts. Yes. My job is to do this. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? So you could bring even some ideas of transactional analysis into this, you know, where, where, how do the adult relationships settle at the end of this play? Um, th there's been, there's been magician and, per, you know, perpetrator and victim. There's been master and servant. There's been father and child. At the end, do we see a group of people, you know, the lovely thing that happens at the end is Miranda who looks at this group of people, she comes and sees all the crew of the ship and all the characters in the play, and she's never seen people before since she was a baby. And her reaction is how beautiful mankind is. Wow, mm. a brave new world that had such people in it. Even though we know that most of them behave badly, she sees the potential. And I always say, you know, I, I worked in a university for a while and I, I loved it. I just, especially October, the students would arrive and it's so beautiful and they're so full of potential and they're cocky and they're, all the rest of it. But, but the, the beauty of young people of the next generation, the excitement of who will they be and what will they do? And I was like that. once. <laughs> it's just oh, lovely. And I love that that comes in at the end of this play, which is really about an old man. Yeah, that's beautiful. And also, it reminds me of, of Gonzalo's speech right at the end of the play, where he says, you know, maybe all of this happened for a reason. Maybe we needed to get swept up here and the shipwreck needed to happen and we all got confused on the island and all these things needed to happen for a reason. And at the end of it, he says, and maybe we all kind of found a part of ourselves that we didn't find in the old system. And everybody found themselves where no man was his own. Mm. So, so is there also something about leaders taking the opportunity in times of crisis, times of change, times of challenge like these are, to help people actualize a part of themselves that before the crisis maybe wasn't activated? Mm, absolutely. And then to encourage people to see it in each other and to celebrate it. So some notion of appreciative inquiry to really say, you know, I, I, we see things in each other that we don't see. We, we see each other's shadow, but we also see each other's potential. You know, that, that's one of the lovely things about a good, a really good feedback model is that you are almost always surprised to be told something that you never thought about yourself. And that, that is definitely, I mean, it's part of leadership anyway, but particularly now people will have found out something about themselves. And, and it may be a be great opportunity to, to see what that means, because especially, I, I imagine, around presentism and absenteeism. You know, if people are going to be working more from home, we know that that is a problem for some leaders. And that is going to properly have to be looked at in the face. How, can I, how do we trust each other? And if people struggle to work from home, if they can't concentrate, how can we help them? 
yeah. you know, these practical things are just as important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we could talk for probably for hours about this, but I wonder, I think maybe we could close because I know you love this speech and I love it when you also speak it out. This speech that you just hinted at with Miranda's kind of noticing this brave new world with all these beautiful people. Maybe you could give us like the whole of that, that piece to kind of close because I think it's a very affirming statement about humanity and, and who we can be at a time like this. Mm. It's, not, it's not very long. It is very beautiful. She says... Um, sorry, I've just got something come up my screen. She says, Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beautiful mankind is. Oh, brave new world that hath such people in it. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's a lovely note to close, I think. Like, what, what a beautiful world that we have, which has such people in it. And that is the, those are the seeds of possibility and hope for the future. Thank you. It was a great romp through the tempest. <laughs> and thanks so much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. You're welcome.